to welcome everyone to this November the 6th, 2023 meeting of the Corsicana ISD Board of Trustees. This is a board workshop and all items that will be discussed have been duly posted. While this is a meeting in public, it is not a meeting of the public. If you wish to speak, please register in the lobby on the audience for guest forms and follow the information on the speaker form. The board's role is to set goals, approve personnel and budgets, make policy and provide oversight. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, provide every child the greatest opportunity to learn, and maintain a safe and secure environment mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. These are our core values, and we appreciate the interest in the students of CISD. So we will go into the superintendent report. Thank you. We are going to begin by just saying how very, very proud we are of um, our junior uh, student at the high school, Sarah Beck. She was named the national champion at the National FFA Agri-Science Fair. She was best in the nation in environmental sciences and natural resources. So we want to congratulate her and let her know how very, very yes. proud we are of her. Um, we had a lot of fun Friday night um, as we honored our 1963 state champion football team. Um, it was wonderful to be in the press box with almost 50 former players, coaches, and their spouses to hear their stories, to see them reconnect with each other. Um, one of the things that they did um, was to sign a book called Run to the Greenhouse that was written by one of the players, Ronnie Ward, and they signed this book and each one took one home. Um, but the most important thing they did was to share their stories and reconnect with each other and they had a wonderful time and I had a wonderful time watching them. We want to congratulate Tim Betts and Brittany Mathis. They've been selected to attend a national super, uh, superintendent, principal leader, maybe superintendents later in your mm -hmm. career, um, a leadership um, forum. They're going to be going um, during their spring break, and it's something that's fully funded by Region 12, but they applied and were chosen for this honor. So we congratulate and appreciate both of them and their leadership development process. I um, want to remind everybody that our holiday card contest has started. Every year we send out beautiful, incredible holiday cards that are designed by one of our students. And so we encourage all of our students to participate in this competition. And the deadline for the entries is November 15th. Thanksgiving break is two weeks away. All our CISD offices and campuses will be closed the week of November 20th, and we will be back on the 27th. And that is our next board meeting. So we look forward to seeing everybody again on November 27th. Dr. Frost, I would like to say um, in regards to the reunion for the classes six, or the football team that won state in 1963, thank you to the communications department. Thank you because my father-in-law was on that team and they raved. The, he had so many um, of you know his teammates that were just, overwhelmed by how great it was and all the thought put into it and so he texted me he was like tell everybody thank you for everything all the hard work because that meant so much to them so thank yeah. you well that goes to raymond michael um who did interviews and videotape those i can't wait to yes. see that video because that, they they had some great things to share great stories and anna also who was yeah. always there working yeah. hard so yeah, yeah. thank you thank you all right, thank you very much. We're gonna go into the discussion action items and first up is Lime Bar Barger Property Value Study, Robbie Harbuck. Dr. Brown, Dr. Frost, trustees, uh, thank y'all for allowing me to come give our report uh, covering property value studies for the district. You'll notice it's 2023 property value study report, but it, re it reports from 96 through 22, the services we've provided. Even though we're in 23, we just finished working on the 22 uh, property value study. So what happens January 31st of every year, there's a property value study released and it gives funding results. The prelim, is it not on? Okay. What it does, it gives, uh, preliminary results to TEA for the 
for the school year for funding. So 22 was released January 31st of 23, was, which was for your 22-23 funding, which is crazy because y'all are in 23-24 and the settlement process is not even done for 22-23. So what happens with the property value study though is as long as your district's valid and your appraisal district has your values in order, you receive a property value study every other year. So you receive a property value study and then a methods and assistance program review. They alternate every other year as long as you're valid. And, and with your district, y'all are an even number methods and assistance program review. So for 2022, your values were valid. They were reported to TEA as valid. But what we did is we reviewed the local roles for adjustments because those values were reported to the district back in July of 22. So they were seven, eight months old by the time we got them in February. And from that time in July when they were certified to the district till they're certified preliminary to TEA, there's you know a lot of changes that can occur and more so here recently because of ARB hearings running later and later every year. So we take and look at the adjusted local role and if anything has been lost and has yielded y'all incapable of collecting on those numbers, we get those corrected and reported correctly to TEA. So then that number becomes a final value in August. So August of 23, the 22 value was certified as final. Uh, and we were able to get, in the letters that I handed out to y'all, our results for the 22 property value study appeal we re re reduced the local rolls by $8.5 million and it results in somewhere around estimated 83,000. Like I said, TEA's in settle up process now. Uh, so those funds will be coming into play because the values have been moved into the summaries of finance. So, and when these property value studies are released every year, like this next cycle, January 31st of 24, the 23 study's gonna be released. So we automatically report to y'all what your findings are, what we'll be doing on your behalf. This round, you will get a property value study. So we'll let you know if it's valid or invalid and what results, uh, or what we'll be doing for the district. We always review for a self-report appeal to correct the local role. If your values go invalid and you receive state fund assignment, then there's another appeal we'll file where we go in and fight the state's category values on residential properties or commercial properties, uh, ag properties, anything that's in your sample that's causing an issue, we will be in this area writing appraisals and fighting the state's value. Now, historically, y'all have not had that issue, so more than likely, if you went invalid, there's two years of grace that the district would receive, and you would receive local fund assignment through year one grace, then possibly year two grace. That third year, if it, the values haven't come back to valid, then you would go to a state fund assignment. We would need to file an appeal to keep you from losing a, a lot of funding that way. So, uh, so historically, we've been filing more self-reporting appeals for y'all. We review those regardless to make sure there's no funding being left behind. Those get you the funding that settle up rather than making you wait for an audit because what happens in August, whenever the values are certified to TEA, that starts a three-year timeline that we can file up to three audits for the district. So, and that does a similar process. It checks the local role for further adjustments. If there's been any lawsuits that have been settled or any late filed homestead exemptions, late ARB hearings that's called, caused further reduction in value, we get those values uh, corrected and get the additional funding for the district. And, and, and another thing that I can report to the district now, the last cycle to close out was 2019. We did an audit review and filed that the end of last year. The first part of this year and through summer, TEA has paid out on that and I reviewed the ledgers. Y'all received an additional $140,150 from that audit. So the next cycle that's closing out is 2020. 
we're reviewing those now and we'll file those this fall or winter whenever things complete. As of right now, we've found another right at 995, right at a million dollars in further reduction on the 2020 to file uh, to get additional gain for the district there also. So, uh, but these time frames do fall from the time you have your assessment date of January 1 till our audit cycles are over with, that PVS carries out four years. So it, it, the calendar can get really goofy on these. But uh, another thing with audits, if you do have a lawsuit that carries on for years, which can happen, say four or five years down the road, you get a lawsuit that's final and y'all have to make a refund of $200,000 because of this lawsuit. Uh, we can file on something like that out of the standard time frame. We have, once, once it's certified to the role by the assessor, we have one year to file an audit to go back and get some additional aid gain on, on something on a final judgment from a lawsuit or something like that. So we're constantly watching that as well. Uh, what I had uh, with my presentation here gives you that historical information in charts. Y'all have this in your board book, but you can see that historically we consistently file uh, for the district and get aid gain for the district. Uh, this, this, this would be the estimate for the 22 current cycle that we just finished out of 83,000 uh, that will come through settle up. These reports are reports that are submitted. These are where TEA is getting their numbers from the state comptroller's office. And as you can see, there's category A, B, C, those are, and it describes that single family that's residential, B's, multifamily residential. Those categories have to make up 5% of your role to be tested. So not all of them are tested. And when you get a sample like this in 22 that has an NA in all the, the weighted ratios under the mean category, that's pretty much letting you know there was not a property value study sample. These values were accepted in the preliminary run and certified to TEA. And then what we have done is gone in and filed a self-report appeal, which adjusted those because the local roles had adjusted, and then the final values uh, have adjusted out to, to what's being certified to TEA now. And those are in place, and uh, TEA has uh, started funding on those. Uh, a lot of this other in the section two is just the timelines and the overview that I went through with when the study's released, you know, preliminary, then final. Because what you start out with, like right now in your 23, 24, y'all are working off a 20, 22 value with a growth rate applied until you get your first 23 preliminary number in January. And then it'll flip over to a 23 value and then it'll go to a final value in August. So, uh, but this is just, just a, what I've gone over with, with the overview. When there are appeals that have to be filed, like self-report appeals, or if we had to get into category appeals, when the study's released January 31st, we only have 40 days to gather all that information and file it to the state as far as, we have a part A form that Dr. Frost signs to authorize even though we're under contract. We have part B, which is all of our objection write-ups, and then our part C, which is all of our evidence. And we have to file those within 40 days, which is March 12th of each year. Uh, and that works either way, whether it's self-report appeal or category appeal. Uh, when we get to the audit cycle, we send an audit authorization form. Even though we're under contract, like I said, the state requires authorization forms for anything we're filing, so we'll always send you an authorization form. And when everything's final, we'll send you a copy of the report. Those reports at, at the front of the uh, presentation here, uh, we sent a copy of that report in February, letting y'all know that y'all were okay, but we're gonna review for a self-report appeal. And then again, when it was final, we sent you a copy of that final one. Uh, but this ties it all together with our annual report. So, but in this, like I said, y'all have it in your board book. I'm not gonna go through all of that. I touched on the timelines. Uh, we do have a 
pretty big staff of resources that we employ. Uh, during the appeal cycle, I'll have 15 people working on appeals. During the audit cycles, I may have six or seven. Uh, we also, uh, a lot of the resources now are not software that you can buy, but subscriptions that you can join. So I, I purchase additional uh, commercial software, uh, cost information from Marshall and Swift so that we, that's what the state uses in their schedules. So I purchase the same information. So if we get into a situation where we have to file a category appeal for y'all, we have all of that to use as evidence against the state. So I believe that covers the overall timeline. We are, uh, there, there's no action needed on the contract. We are under, back in uh, 16 or 17, uh, they put in play 1295 forms where the districts had to go in every year and into the ethic. We had to, when we got a contract, we had to file a 1295 form and we, we had a lot of districts that would have turnover and they couldn't find their passwords. They couldn't get in to acknowledge these 1295s. So in, in visiting with a lot of the districts, we had a lot of evergreen contracts anyway, so we went into an evergreen contract with the district here. I mean, it is active. It doesn't take action to continue that. The only action would be if y'all ever decided you wanted to terminate that, which I would hope would be able to resolve any issue to create that or keep that from happening. But uh, this is also in the information y'all have in, in the board book. But any of that, uh, if you have an opportunity to <laughs> go through and read, uh, if you have additional questions, uh, Dr. Frost can get with me and I'll be glad to come back or do whatever we need to do to answer additional questions or uh, if anything pops up that, that beyond this that y'all have questions about. We have, of course, the delinquent tax collections. That's a different division. We have... Uh, school finance specialist on staff. We have truth and taxation specialist on staff. So any of that that y'all ever need assistance with, you can reach out to me and I'll get you to the right section of the firm to do that. Anybody think of anything that I may not have touched on or hopefully I didn't go too overboard, but there is a lot of different dates and timelines to follow with what go, like I said, it, uh, one, one, one cycle can last four years, so it's a lot to, and, and, and we have adjusted our, back in 19, TEA, well, TEA didn't do it, the legislature did it, they flipped from prior year funding current year to current year funding current year, so we've had to adjust our audit cycles. We had already reviewed a 19 audit for y'all in the past, when it was prior year funding current, we could review sooner, file them, and move on. Well, now that it flipped to current year funding current, and we finally have toward the end of those cycles that we could review, that uh, additional $140,000 that we just got the district, if we hadn't have gone back and reviewed them again, that would have been left behind. So we reviewed that for all of our districts. I found that our 19 audits originally generated $600 million in value reduction overall. Our second review has pulled in another $1.2 billion in value reduction. So the other firms that are still following that old trend aren't catching those numbers. And we're the same way right now with 2020. We're reviewing that at this point. Originally, we got $1.2 billion in reduction. We're at $1.3 billion in additional reduction now. Now, 21 moving forward, we've been in these cycles long enough with current year now that 21 will go back to a normal. It'll be toward the end of the cycle and we won't be filing. They're burning now. You know, we can only file three audits. So now if something happens and the districts need to file an audit during an earlier period because of a large reduction, we can file that, but we'll still follow up with a review toward the end of the cycle to make sure funding's not being left behind. Thank <laughs> you.
a lot of information, but I, I didn't mean to throw so much no, out there. No, it's great. It's, yeah. the, the fact of the matter is we got $149,000 when you walked in today. So, you know, come back anytime. Um, um, no, I really appreciate that. It was very, very good information because it's very interesting that you can go back that far and still get and yeah. still have money coming to us. So. Right. Very, very good information to have for us. So I really, really appreciate your firm. Yeah. Thank you. If anything Thank comes you. up that you have additional questions, y'all just let me know. Or if you ever get anything from the CAD that you're questioning, let me know. Uh, I know Bud, we can get with him and take care of whatever. Yeah. I mean, you might get something on a lawsuit that you're questioning. And, you know, it may be a delinquent tax suit, but it may be something dealing with property value stuff. Anything that's ever questioned shoot it to me and I'll take care of it one way or another. So. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good evening. All right, you too. Thank y'all. All right. FCCLA Katie Collins, Region 3 Vice President of Projects. Collins. Um, I am the VP of projects of, um, uh, of our region three. I am president of our chapter and I am here to introduce FCCLA to all of y'all. So first things first, FCCLA is an acronym and it stands for Family Career Com Community Leaders of America. Now on the chapter level, these are advisors. Cassie Rich, uh, Cassie, Cassie Rich, um, Christy, Shelby Curl, Paige Griffin, and those are our four advisors for this year. Now our members can be anyone that pay their dues, and the dues this year are $25. Members will have the opportunity to participate in community service events, incentive trips, competitions, and are able to build connections with other people around the regions and in our own chapter. Now, some of the community service events that we've been involved in is the Angel Tree Project for the Salvation Army, the Salvation Army's bell ringing, the Thanksgiving box distribution, which we're also repeating this November, um, and goodie bags that we passed out to some of the staff in order to show our appreciation for our teachers and staff at the school. Now, some of our incentive trips included the State Fair that we did this past October, we also have Friendsgiving every November. Um, pumpkin uh, decorating was also a contest we like to throw out there in order to promote involvement. And then we also are able to bring some of our members to the mall, such as in Arlington or in Dallas. One, they uh, gather enough points, and points are gained through attending meetings, to uh, involving themselves in the community service events, and um, such as one of the events, the stovetop that we're donating to the Compassion Corsicana. Now, an important part of FCCLA is also competitive events, such as my position, which is Vice President of Projects. So star events and projects are types of competitions that are part of FCCLA, and they coordinate with the national programs. There's eight national programs, but Five of the ones that we're mainly focusing on this year are Community Service, Facts, Families First, Stand Up, and Student Body. The Region 3 Conference is always stationed in Waco, Texas in order for everybody involved to get together. The State one is always in Dallas since that's the central point, and the Nationals this year are in Seattle, Washington. And I know that was a short presentation, but I would like to thank y'all for having me, and if y'all have any questions, go ahead. Uh, currently, we have almost about like 200 or more members because the, um, we can't, don't know the exact number due to the fact that more people have joined this year. But yes, and um, because of the large school and large numbers we have, we do have about 200 or so. Anything else? Okay, perfect. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Now we're going to talk about dual credit. We're going to ask Mr. Doring to come up and talk about our dual credit um, standards. Um, a lot of changes for next year because of the changes in the legislature and the opportunities um, that we have, um, well, and that Navarro College has for additional funding. But in doing, in saying all this, it's important that we maintain our standards, that we keep dual credit where it needs to be. And so I'm just gonna ask him to briefly talk about this with you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Frost, Dr. Brown. Uh, yes, we did revamp the standards for dual credit uh, we added a few things, and y'all have that in your board book, uh, to make sure that on the front end that uh, we are getting the, the students who earn their way into dual credit. And uh, it is a, a competitive program at Navarro, and it's going to get more competitive with House Bill 3. So we wanted to make sure that the, the students earn their way into that program. So uh, in your board book, there are some uh, new requirements for, uh, for the dual credit program. If you have any questions on that, I'll be happy to ask, answer any questions you have. Yeah, Mr. Dorian, I have one question. I see that um, below 70 is considered failing. Now, is that is that like our other programs when you're in AP and things like that, they get the 10 extra points? That's correct. For UIL, you do, if you're in the dual credit program, you do get the 10 points added to your grade. Uh, to make you eligible for UIL competitions. Yes, yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you. We have about, um, with the new, and I'll just uh, just briefly tell you, the House Bill 3, with uh, House Bill 3, basically, uh, if you are low socioeconomic uh, and you filled that form out and you're eligible for that, you do get to go to Navarro College and not pay. Uh, so about 80% of our students that go to Navarro College um, earn that. So that's a, that's a big deal for them. So Mr. Doran, on the kids that um, are like in welding and then also like cosmetology, like cosmetology is from two to seven. So do they, how do they get there if they don't have transportation? We have transportation to, like for the two to seven programs, we uh -huh. get them to the, to the uh, Navarro College. Uh, they have to provide their own transportation after. And that's kind of part of it. We have parent meetings and things like that to make sure everyone's prepared okay. to do that. Yes, ma'am. But we do get them to the college. In some programs, we do provide transportation to the college and back, the ones that happen during the day. And but, in regards to Seth's question um, about the 10 extra points, that is only for UIL. So if they yes, actually fail the class, Navarro, they fail. But they could actually right. have a, a passing grade looking at UIL right. to be able to play or mm -hmm. participate in extracurricular. That's but, correct. Okay. That's correct. And, and every district's different on on how they how they view that and how, how you get to be eligible when you're taking those honors courses or pre-AP courses or dual credit courses. But uh, yes, we add 10 points and that's our policy here. So yes, but, but their grade is their grade. Now it is weighted different in their GPA because it is like an honors course. The dual credit courses are like honors courses. But it would show up on the Navarro transcript as a failure. Yes, yeah. yes. Or it would actually show up as on the Navarro transcript as a D. Yeah. Because they have D, so. And then you said with House Bill 3, um, roughly 80% of our kids won't pay. That's correct. So for us, this should be a, should be a good thing, right? Because we won't Save have to. We'll have, we can save some money. Correct? It is a good thing, but our students already uh, uh, don't pay. Right. So, uh, but it's 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 but House Bill do. Three is actually for the we community pay. college. <laughs> but we pay. We yes. Pay. We so, pay. so it'll yeah, be a savings for the school. Will we still be that? I think it's a we, discount. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. We'll st we'll, we will still be paying their tuition. Yes, ma'am. We we get a discounted rate, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll still have to pay, but not as much. Okay. But yes, that's, that's good. But for our students, like for example, mm -hmm. our cosmetology students in the past have had to pay for their, uh, their kits. Kits. Uh, they they will not have to pay for that in the future, that's because of House Bill Three, yeah. things like that. Books. There should be a savings for us. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Doring. Okay. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. The enrollment report 
snapshot day. Okay, last Friday was our snapshot day, and we turned in, in our PEAMS report, the Texas Education Agency, a total of 6,079 students. That's how many students we had enrolled in Corsicana ISD on that day. Um, we had some legislation that um, sought to have funding based on enrollment. However, it did not get approved. So I need to stress that it's our, um, the, the funding that comes into the district is based on the attendance of those 6,079 students. Um, so it's important that parents and students understand not only for their education, because we can't teach them if, we're, if they're not here, but it is critical that they come to school every day because that is what our funding is based on. So just a couple of important um, numbers that are here. There's a lot of numbers here. Um, it's all broken down, all the report is broken down by student demographics, <coughs> all the special education data, the student programs and indicators. But it's important that we note that under the student demographics, our predominant um, students are Hispanic or Latino with 55.42% of our student population, uh, or 3,369 students. Also, it's important instructionally um, that you remember that emergent bilingual is 29.77, almost 30% of our students are emergent, are labeled as emergent bilingual. And then we have 162 transfer students. So those are students who come into Corsicana ISD from other districts. And then this year we've hit almost 80% in economically disadvantaged, 79.14%. So those are some in really in informative and interesting numbers. Um, our district continues to, to change and to grow. And so we are happy to have every one of those students who are here and we want them to come to school every day. What was our percentage last year of the um, um, economically disadvantaged? I think it was about 74%. So we 5% increase. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Frost? All right. Ms. Harrison, do we have any audience or guests? All right, thank you. All right. Uh, we are going to adjourn into closed session as permitted by Texas Government Code Section 551.01.